Hi everyone, I'm Allison Miller. I'm the Division Director of Behavioral Health Education for West Florida Division. And I'm the one that you've been getting all the emails and Facebook posts from. I have a couple of topics that I wanted to talk with you about. I thought I would just post it in a video instead of sending you another email. Um, the first is that I got a call this morning from a colleague of yours talking about how he was feeling sort of bogged down by the theorists. I want to remind all of you that um, if you would you know, like a copy, if you haven't already received a copy of this handout that I've put together on the theorists, by all means get in touch with me. Give me an email, drop me a note on Facebook, and let me know that you'd like me to send you a copy of this so you can print it out and work with it. I think this handout on the theorists will suit your needs um, better than the book, probably. First of all, it includes two theorists that aren't even included in the book. Um, We've got uh, Aaron Beck, cognitive behavioral therapist that almost all of us use on the behavioral health units, and Carl Rogers, who gets mentioned a lot. So um, the rest of them are all in the book, but if you want this particular handout, I'm happy to email it to you. It, got, it has everything sort of organized in this easy graph chart sort of fashion. Um, one thing that I can tell you is I would not spend five minutes memorizing anything having to do with Freud. Becoming familiar with Freud is a good idea. You want to know what his basic construct was, but the idea that you have to have all that memorized or that you have to have any of the theories memorized is, um, I think, probably a waste of time. Uh, becoming familiar with them is a good idea. Talking about the theorists, you should become familiar with Hildegard Peplau's work. Hildegard Peplau is considered to be the mother of psychiatric nursing. And the best way to understand her work or to think about her work is that she um, brought the concept of the nurse as a part of the therapeutic team and as an agent of, of healing into the psychiatric construct. In the past, remember back when Hildegard Peplau was a nurse, uh, nurses were seen more as clerks or gophers, uh, the, the people who did the bidding of the doctors. And we weren't seen as independent practitioners at all at that point. So her idea was to view the nurse and understand that the nurse in the relationship that the nurse can build with the patient is someone who can be very instrumental in affecting healing and growth in the patient. Um, this is a construct that is useful for understanding how we approach patients today and how influential those ideas were uh, in forming how psychiatric nursing has evolved. So we owe a pretty big debt to Hildegard Peplau. She had a, she had a lot of really good ideas. Remember though that her constructs, when you get to reading about her work, remember that her constructs are based on the, the medical model at the time where psychiatric patients were in the hospital for sometimes months. And that this idea that you could have an introductory phase of, of working with the patient and getting to know each other, and then there was a real working phase, and then there was a, a, a conclusion phase where you worked on ending or concluding the relationship. We have to adapt that to today's world where patients are often in our care for 24 hours or three days or eight days at the most kind of thing. Um, but she's a good one to know about. She's not one of the developmental theorists. Her work comes later in the book and therefore later in the readings, but I, I wanted to mention her. Her work is based more on uh, Harry Stack Sullivan's uh, constructs. So anyway, so I wanted to talk to you about theorists. The second thing I wanted to tell you is if you're looking at this handout that I've given you on, that I've sent you on the four weeks of uh, psychiatric nursing studying for the, for the board exam. Um, we are currently in week three and it says the suggested readings are about 46 pages of reading, uh, 117, page 117 through 161. Uh, that's mostly chapter four. It's a big chunk of work, but I wanted to break it down a little bit for you. I'm going to be sending you a PowerPoint on personality disorders that I hope will help 
sort of work through um, the confusion about personality disorders, I've got a way of thinking about them that I think will help chunk them together a little bit more easily for you. And then uh, the next part for, for week three is to take the ANCC's practice exam. That's free. Once you've gone on the website, you should be able to, um, by going through the psychiatric nursing specialty area, there should be an, uh, a bullet point there of taking the practice exam. I must have taken that practice exam six times, I'd say. Uh, I wanted to get fluent not just in the material that it was teaching, but also in the way that ANCC puts together their test questions and how, th how to think them through. And I found taking the exams over and over again to be one of the most helpful things to do in getting prepared for the exam. Reading the material was the first, taking those exams over and over again was the second. Okay. Um, and you should keep checking in with Facebook if you're on Facebook. There's sometimes, especially Denise Montgomery, who's posting all kinds of great stuff. Um, sometimes there are some things on there, like today Robert Fry posted how to print the study cards that uh, are in HealthStream on, that will help you study for the board exam. And on that note, I wanted to show you, take my little computer here over to my other computer. Okay. You see that? That is, can it show up? Oh, I don't know if it's showing up or not. Um, anyway, it's the, here, let me scroll down. Here, there we go. That's better. If you can see, RNBC colon psych mental health study cards. Okay, it's on health stream. If you go to that and you can, uh, Robert's got it posted on Facebook how to go about printing them out. Um, I'll have to, I'll have to see if I can sort of trace along how he did that. I'm not ent entirely sure. Uh, for next week, suggested reading is another, another chapter. It's about 41 pages and it is 168 to, through 209. Um, and I'm also going to be sending you a link on how to take another online exam, but that's next week. For this week, it's reading chapter four, um, looking through my PowerPoint on personality disorders and taking the ANCC's free practice exam, okay? Um, I wanna show you some of the other things that I've sent out, make sure everybody's gotten them and can use them. In addition to the study cards that are on uh, HealthStream, I put together some terms to know and sent these out to everybody. If you have lost track of this or printed it out and have lost and deleted the email and would like another copy of this, by all means, drop me a note, send me a message on Facebook. I'll be happy to resend it to you. These are some of the terms that are on here. Agnosia, um, aphasia, alogia, ataxia, akathisia, anhedonia. Okay, those are the A's. You should know the difference between negative symptoms and positive symptoms. When we get into talking about schizophrenia, that's going to be especially important. Um, poverty of speech, it's good, a good term to know. Uh, splitting is something we experience a lot on the unit, but a lot of people don't understand it exactly the way it's intended, so be sure to, to get that understood. Um, you're going to need to know the difference between transference and countertransference, even though that's a Freudian construct and I said not to study Freud, those two ideas out of Freud's concepts are actually still used today very uh, frequently. It's good to understand uh, the difference between transference and countertransference and the influence that those issues have in how we relate to the patient. That's important stuff. All right, so this is the study group terms to know handout. I've also sent you guys directions for registering with ANCC. I want to make sure that you have this um, and that you can follow these instructions for getting registered. You won't be able to take the exam just by getting on there, signing up, picking a date, and that's it. You have to register with ANCC and you have to prove that you've taken or you've got to record with them uh, 30 CEUs in behavioral health before they will give you the code to do the registering for
for the exam itself. Uh, it's a little bit of a you know complicated process, but it's not. You you guys deal with things that are a lot more complicated every day at work. This is just you got to take it step by step and do it their way. So follow those directions. If you don't have the directions, let me know. I'll be happy to send them to you again. It's very specific. It's just follow the bouncing ball kind of thing. Um, you'll have no trouble um, getting registered if you follow these instructions, okay? Uh, the next handout I want to make sure everybody has is on anxiety, which is what this week's chapter is all about. Uh, I wanted to give you some really concrete bullet points to study on anxiety, and this handout is what will help you study for it. It's not the only thing you should read. Don't lean on this exclusively. You've got to read the book. There's a lot of really good things in the book to study as well. But this will help sort of zero in on some of the key topics. Um, let's see. The difference of the impact that low levels of serotonin will have, uh, the impact that high levels of epinephrine, norepinephrine will have, um, the role that GABA plays in it, and then a, just a listing of some of the medications that are used to treat anxiety. So there's that as well. Um, that should pretty well do the sort of uh, review of everything that I have put out there for you. I want to uh, look at the book for just a couple of minutes. I know this is running long. I can see it's already 11 and a half minutes, and I want to cut this off by no later than 12 or 13 minutes. So... Um, when you go into the section on anxiety, when you go to, to what is it, chapter, what is it, to the, this week, chapter four, um, you, I, I didn't find um, focusing on the nursing diagnoses to be terribly helpful. Memorizing nursing diagnoses, I don't think, makes any sense at all because our nursing diagnoses are, are very logical and intuitive. Things like, when somebody is experiencing pain, um, having a, a, a nursing diagnosis of anxiety or hopelessness makes perfect sense. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's see. So uh, anxiety disorders. On page 117, there's a lot of very good information about the the. Uh, patho pathogenesis of anxiety is what they call it, the origin, the physiologic origins of anxiety. Understanding the physiology of anxiety will really serve you well when you come up against understanding the medications because then everything starts to make perfect sense. So I would take the time to really learn page 117 and 118. It's only half of the page there. Um, and I would become familiar with the DSM-5 diagnoses, what they all are. What they've got listed here is panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, phobia, that includes agoraphobia as one of them, obsessive compulsive disorder as one of the disorders, body dysmorphic disorder, that's a good one to know about. They could very well um, put a couple of questions in there about that. Hoarding as an anxiety disorder. Uh, I can never pronounce this right, trichotillomania, which is this hair pulling disorder. Um, skin picking, called excoriation disorder, and then uh, and separation anxiety disorder. Now, there is a new category, different from the way it used to be when uh, the DSM-4 was out. The DSM-5 has a differentiation of PTSD as not being an anxiety disorder, but a trauma-related disorder. That's an important distinction to make. Trauma-related disorders include post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, which is sort of the warm-up act to PTSD. That is to say, acute stress disorder, you can figure it out just from its term, acute, meaning it's the initial, it's the early stage, short-term stress response to something traumatic. PTSD is when something has kind of taken hold and gotten stuck, and you can't disengage from the experience. Um, they say that um, adjustment disorder is a trauma-related disorder. That's interesting. I don't, I guess I can go along with that. And then rape trauma syndrome. You should know that 
I don't know that it'll come up in the exam, but rape trauma syndrome is considered to be almost a 100 percent um, of a chance of developing it after a rape. Almost nobody goes through a rape and has no symptoms afterwards. So it's considered to be uh, a given. And then the NANDA anxiety disorder, uh, NANDA diagnoses of, uh, of the uh, anxiety disorders, I don't think you're going to need to memorize those or anything like that, okay? You should know about the primary feeding and eating disorders in general terms. The difference between uh, anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating. Okay, in summary, really quick, anorexia is when people basically don't eat and don't want to eat. Um, and they, there's all kinds of symptoms that go along with it, particularly weight loss. With bulimia, people are eating, but they're purging in some way. So their weight is often um, somewhat normal. Bulimia is a lot tougher to diagnose, but it's very dangerous because the vomiting or the purging that they're doing throws their electrolytes way off. Um, binge eating is exactly what it sounds like. It's just eating and eating and eating and not doing anything to purge. So that's the basic um, summary of the three, just in terms of getting them straight. Okay, There's a good chart on page 123 on those. And then getting in, into substance use disorders, I would spend quite a bit of time reading through this material and using your highlighter like I did. I didn't waste, I'm telling you, I did, I did not spare the hi highlighter at all. Page after page, I was highlighting things and then going back and rereading my highlighted sections after I'd read the whole book. And then once you get to page 130, 131, um, there's a summary on the personality disorders this is the classic way of clustering them. I'm going to send you a slightly different way that I think is a little bit easier to think about these anxiety disorders. They've got cluster A, cluster B, cluster C. And um, my way of looking at it is basically that, that there are two types of personality, two categories of personality disorders. A whole, one whole group of personality disorder is trying to push people away. And another group of personality disorders are those that are trying to draw people in. And then there's the borderline personality disorder that is ambivalent and does both, which is why it's so difficult for us to work with borderline personality disorder, because we never know whether they're trying to pull us in or push us away, because they themselves are so severely um, ambivalent about it. Not for nothing, just so you know, there's a whole uh, body of thought now that's looking at, po at uh, borderline personality disorder as a subset of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, because almost universally people with BPD have experienced un unbelievably bad um, trauma in their childhood. And because of that, they constantly feel ambivalent about whether they want people close or want people away or want people close or want people away back and forth. But if you, once you read through this on the book on uh, personality disorders, then you look at my PowerPoint, it'll just be a different way of learning the same material. But it's, it's good to know. Um, you can read through the this, this human sexuality and sleep disorders. I didn't have anything on my exam about those. I think if I were going to uh, sort of triage my time, I would put a lot of time and effort into um, delirium, dementia, and, um, and the substance abuse stuff here. I think that would really be a good way of spending your time. Make sure you know the, the terminologies, as I said before. Um, what else? There's a really good set of neurodevelopmental disorders summary on page 141, 142, 143, 144, and I would become familiar with those terms and those diagnoses. That's a good idea. And then it, then it goes into suicide. And, you know, that's something that we've all got to know about crisis, crisis intervention and suicide. So that's basically where I would put your time and energy. You should, um, yeah, the milieu therapy stuff we don't do very much of. And the, yeah, I would, st I would stick with those. I wouldn't put a lot of time and effort into seclusion and restraint safety other than to know the basics, which you almost certainly know by working on the unit. So I hope that that helps you study for this week's portion. 
Um, if you have any questions, you guys can call me on my cell phone. It's 727-336-3131. Pretty easy cell phone number to, to reach. If you want to text me to that number, that's fine too. I don't mind that at all. Uh, and you can always reach me by email. I'm pretty quick. I carry my phone around. It's got my email on it. Um, so I, I'm pretty accessible. I think that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'll try to post another video in a week or two and bring you some more information. In the meantime, just stay calm and study on. Talk to you soon.